Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate our visitors that's here with us. We appreciate you that's listening out in the radio listening audience. Hoping today we can be a real inspiration to you. And as most every Sunday, we insist on you calling someone out there in the listening audience and have them to tune in and get the broadcast beyond for the hour coming up. I want to be a blessing to everyone we possibly can. So we appreciate your presence here. Appreciate you being here today. May the Lord bless you. Appreciate you in the radio listening audience. Now, last Sunday morning, we had trouble with our tape recorder, and we did not get to record last Sunday morning's message or singing, so we'll forget about that. So we're recording today's program. Brother John Bruce is letting us use his recorder. We have it stationed here in the office and recording the program. And it'll be tape number 269. And if you'd like to have today's program, you can get it for $3.00. And the gift is used to help defray our radio expense. I'd like for you to pray for me and write to me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. Take your Bible today and turn, would you please, to the book of Psalms 142 for verse of Scripture and then Luke chapter 10. I was reading the other day where that this young boy that really fell in love with the young girl he thought at first sight and he decided he had just sent her a postal card every day for 365 days and just tell her how much he cared for her and all of that. So he bought her 365 postal cards and he wrote a little note on each one. And for 365 days, she received those postal cards. And at the end of the 365 days, she married the postman. All right, Psalms 142. And verse 4, I looked on my right hand and beheld there was no man that would know me. Refuge fell me. No man cared for my soul. No man cared for my soul. All thy mind and thy neighbors thyself. He said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And in verse 30, And Jesus answered, said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. By chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, poured in oil and wine, set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and what shalt thou spendest more? When I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. I'm going to speak to you today on this subject, the good Samaritan. Now, if you notice here, a young religious lawyer came to Jesus, trying to justify himself, trying to trap the Son of God, want to know what he must do to inherit eternal life. Well, you don't do things to inherit eternal life. You don't inherit eternal life. It's a gift from God. Now, Jesus told him what to do. If he'd do it, it would point him to Jesus, of course. He said, keep the law. And, of course, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. You're not saved by keeping the law, but if that young lawyer had abided by the law, it had pointed him to Jesus. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Jesus. And the law kind of guides us along and pushes us toward the Lord Jesus Christ in that sense. And for man will hear the word of God, hear the law of God, realize how sinful he really is, then he can come to the Savior and get something done about him. And so I want to speak to you today on the message that Jesus gave this young religious Pharisee, a religious lawyer of his day. And this is a great message. I want to expatiate upon these verses and point out some pragmatic thoughts 
a prophetic thought and then a dispensational thought that's found here in the scripture. And you follow me closely, take your Bible, look at it verse by verse, and let's see what God is saying. Now remember, this certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, geographically speaking, you go downhill all the way from Jerusalem down to Jericho. I've traveled that road many, many times in my Holy Land tours. I stopped by the spot of ground, and they have a building there, which was not there in the time that this was written. But they have a building there they call the Good Samaritan Inn. It's supposed to be at the same place where the Old Samaritan Inn stood at that time. I've been there, I've had pictures made standing beside the building. But this man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Every outstanding proper name in the Bible usually has an outstanding meaning. The name Jerusalem means possession of peace. The name Jericho is a city upon which God placed a curse. Now you remember that in the Bible. And this man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho from a possession of peace and fell under a curse. That's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. The man Adam went down, he fell, he sinned against God. God expelled him from the Garden. And when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, then of course the entire human race went down in Adam. And every person that's ever been born into this world came here born a sinner except the Lord Jesus Christ. And so man went down in Adam and the entire human race is down today. It's depraved, it's without God, it needs to be lifted up and made alive. And the only way you can be lifted up and made alive is through faith in Jesus Christ. He quickens you and makes you alive in Him. The Spirit of God does that. Now this man went down, he's a type of Adam, going down in the Garden of Eden. In Romans chapter 5 verse 19, By one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And so we went down, Adam, we come back to God through Jesus Christ. Man is down today, the human race is down today, the human race needs to be lifted up, it needs help. And this man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and so man is under curse today according to the Bible. Secondly, in verse 30, he fell among thieves. Now that's exactly what happened in the garden, that the devil's always been a thief, a liar, and the devil and his imps, of course, we find always working against God's people. And these robbers here is a picture of the devil and his imps, his demons. And this man fell among thieves, and the Bible said he was stripped. Now that's what happened to Adam. He was stripped. Adam walked around in the garden, he and his wife, and God commanded them to take care of the garden. But when they sinned of God, they were stripped of the righteous standing before God and became naked before God. And God expelled them from the garden, and you know the story. And so the human race has been stripped of any righteous standing it might have before God. It has none. Our righteous is as filter rags, so saith the word of God. Now the Bible said these thieves and robbers that robbed this man on the road down from Jerusalem to Jericho, stripped him and wounded him, and left him half dead. That's also a picture of the human race today, spiritually dead, and physically dying. In Isaiah chapter 1 to verse 6, God gives us a picture here of the human race without God. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been clothed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. So the human race is wounded and wounded by the God of this world system. You out in sin, you that uh, fought and, and erect your health and so forth. Now you can get saved and God will save your soul, but you may carry that scar the remainder of your days. You may suffer you die in a body that you wreck by uh, drinking alcohol or by taking dope or by fighting or doing some other things that's evil and wicked. And you may have to carry that scar and suffer in the rest of your days, but God can save your soul and see you as though you'd never sinned. And this is a picture of the human race. And the Bible says in verse 30, These things departed, leaving the man half dead. They went on their way after they had robbed him and stripped him and wounded him. They had no further need of him, so they went on their way. That's exactly what the devil will do for you. The devil will rob you and strip you and hurt you and wound you and leave you and go on his way, but he'll be back. If you don't get right with God, he'll come back and try to do the same thing over again. 
And so the devil is not your friend. You need to know that. No doubt out in the radio listening audience right now, there's some of you listening out there. You went out last night, you drank rot gut liquor, and you got the headache this morning, and uh, you don't feel like even sitting up because of your sins and your weakness. Some of you went out to the dance floor, and you hugged other men's wives last night. Other men hugged your wives and, and moved around on the floor as you listened to what they call music. And there you engaged in sin and, and so forth, and you're not feeling good about it this morning. You say, preach, I don't like that. Well, God didn't call me to preach what you like. God called me to preach what you need. And so you need to realize that. Now, the devil, he'll get you in trouble. He'll wind you up. He'll, he'll get you um, uh, so discouraged and despondent and get you tied up in sin, get you in prison, break up your home. He'll do everything he can to destroy you because he's not your friend. So these thieves were on their way after they robbed and stripped the man, left him wounded and half dead. Notice number three in verse 31. The Bible said, a priest came by. Now, the priest in the Bible, he represents religion. This priest came along. He saw the man had already been robbed, so he didn't have any need for him, so he went on his way. Now, beloved priest in the Old Testament represents religion. After Adam and Eve fell in the garden, then, of course, here comes religion with all of its ceremonies and rituals and so forth. But religion could not lift man to God. We're living in a very religious world today. The entire world is religious but without God. The devil doesn't care how much religion you get as long as you don't get saved. He'll help you get a good case of religion. And so this priest came by representing religion, saw the man had been robbed, so he went on his way. And so today, religion cannot help men to God. You need to realize that. Religion will blind you and lead your soul to hell. Number four, we see a Levite came by in verse 32. Now this Levite is a man that ministered around the tabernacle and so forth. And we'll say that he kind of represents the law in a sense. Well, after religion came along, all of its ceremonies and deeds and so forth couldn't lift the human race back to God that fell in Adam. So the law comes on the scene. God gives the law. God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. God gave the ceremonial laws. There was the civil law and so forth. But the law, when it came on the sea, it could not lift the human race back to God either. It only showed the human race up. It showed how weak and how sinful men are and how weak the human race is. So the law could not save men. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, Well, for the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So law can't save people. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So the, 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 the Levite just looked at him, showed him up, and went on his way. Now you can go out here and quote the Ten Commandments, give that sin of the law, so thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and so forth. He'll say, I know that. I know that, but I need more than that. I need somebody to help me to God. I need something done for me. That's a picture of that sinner today. Number four, we find in verse 33, or rather number five it is, we find in verse 33, a certain Samaritan as he journeyed. Now Jesus here called himself a certain Samaritan. Now the reason he did that is because the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans in those days. And this priest, this Levite, and this man, they were all Jews. And of course they had no dealings with the Samaritans. They would deviate around Samaria rather than go through the town if they passed that way. But a certain Samaritan as he journeyed. John chapter 4 and verse 9 said the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. In Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 8, the Bible tells us then that Jesus made himself of no reputation, came will be done to death, even the death of the cross, that you and I might be lifted to God. So he pictures himself here as the Samaritan. And the Bible says in verse 33, as he journeyed, Jesus said, I came down from heaven. He did. And he took a journey on the earth and he went back to heaven. As he journeyed, he came down to the fallen man. As he journeyed, he came down to the fallen race. Jesus came where we were. We couldn't go to him, but he came to us. He came where we were. He might lift us back to God. And so he, as he journeyed, in verse 33, he came where he was. Jesus came to the fallen human race that he might lift us to God. In John chapter 6 and verse 38, he said, I came down from heaven, and he surely did. Jesus came down from heaven, born of a virgin, did his ministry, died on a cross, buried and rose again, went back to heaven. 
And then in verse 33, he saw him. He used his eyes. The good Samaritan saw the man. And so did Jesus see you one day in sin. And the Spirit of God began to prick your heart. And some of you did something about it. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3, The eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the evil and the good. So you don't hide anything from God. He sees every move you make. He knows all about you. And he said his eyes are beholding the good and the evil. And then he had compassion on him. That came from his heart. You know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed Him shall perish but have everlasting life. Great compassion, heart of God. Great love have no man than this, that a man laid on his life for his, his friends. John chapter 15, verse 13. And then in verse 34, the Bible said He used His feet. He went to Him. Jesus used his feet, walked up and down the shores of Galilee, walked around Jerusalem, went from place to place, saving people, healing people, helping people. He used his feet, and finally, the fallen human race nailed those precious feet to a, a cruel Roman cross. And then the Bible says, uh, they bound up his wounds. Verse 34, he used his hands. The Son of God moved around from place to place. He touched the leper, he healed the leper. He touched the blind man's eyes. He took babies in his arms. He touched people. He used his hands while he was on the earth. He ministered even to the apostles and disciples. And finally, this fallen human race, these cruel Roman soldiers nailed those precious hands to that old rugged cross. They nailed the hands of Jesus. But he used his hands. And then in verse 34, the Bible said he poured in oil and wine. The good Samaritan poured in oil and wine. Oil in the Bible as a type, of, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Wine in the Bible is a type of blood and a type of joy. And so he poured in oil, that is, the Holy Spirit. The Bible said, without the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. Now, when God saves you, He puts within you the Spirit of God and seals you with the Holy Spirit on the day of redemption. So no man can be saved without the Holy Spirit of God. Without the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. We have those today that teach grave error. They say you can be saved today, later receive the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. That's unscriptural. That's not according to the Bible. No man can be saved apart from the Holy Spirit. The very moment you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes in you, quickens you, makes you alive, and seals you on the day of redemption, and then after that does many, many things for you. So he just poured in oil. Now, God is not stingy with the Holy Spirit. I like to see people yield to the fullness of the Spirit. God will fill us with the Spirit if we're willing to yield to the fullness of the Spirit of God. And when you're filled with God's Spirit, you usually have it. I like to see people filled with God's Spirit. I like to hear them say amen once in a while. I like to hear people say praise the Lord. I like to hear people say hallelujah. There's no need to sit back there and, and get half to death, pray to open your mouth. You say amen once in a while. Say an amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah to this Baptist preacher. It's like hollering sick him to a hound dog, brother. I like for you to do it once in a while. Don't be so tight-laced. If you feel like saying amen, say amen. Be sure you sit in the right place. Don't be like the man that said when the preacher said, and that man went to hell, the man said amen, praise God. You don't need to say amen right there. Beloved, you, there's a rightful place to say praise the Lord, a rightful place to say amen, and, and once in a while say hallelujah. Hallelujah is a word that's known all over the world. Has it been changed? Well, you can go anywhere in the world say hallelujah where the gospel has been preached and they know what you're talking about. It won't hurt to say hallelujah. Hallelujah once in a while. Praise the Lord once in a while. Amen once in a while. That's right, preacher, once in a while. That helps us preach. You ought to do that. Don't be so shameful and, and bashful and about it. Just speak up and say amen if a preacher is telling the truth. And I believe I am telling the truth. So he poured in oil and he poured in wine. On the day of Pentecost, the Bible said these men are full of new wine. Why? Because they were happy. They were rejoicing. They were quoting from the Psalms of the wonderful works of God evidently. They were quoting from the Psalms the wonderful works of God. They were praising God. They were shouting. And they were rejoicing because they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible says in Psalms 105 verse 15, And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, 
oil to make his face shine and bread which strengthened man's heart. In Judges chapter 19 verse 13 said, These men are full of new wine. Now if you get happy in the Lord and begin to praise the Lord, somebody might think there's something wrong, but they don't understand what's taking place. What's taking place is you're drinking the wine from heaven, amen. And the Spirit of God is blessing you and the Word of God is strengthening you and blessing you and you just want to raise your hand while I say glory. Amen. Hallelujah. There's nothing wrong in raising your hand occasionally. The Bible says through the Psalms, through the Bible, with uplifted hands, they praise the Lord. You don't have to be so bashful that you never raise your hand. Just slip that hand up. You can't say it if they raise your hand once in a while. We'll know about that. You're enjoying the message and God's speaking to your heart. And so the Bible says the Holy Spirit, the wine will give you joy and happiness as you sojourn. We need it today. Acts chapter 2 and verse 13, these men are full of new wine. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, without the Spirit of Christ are none of his. And so the good Samaritan was not stingy with his oil. He just literally poured it in. God is not stingy with the Holy Spirit. God is not stingy with the wine of joy. He just pours it in. And it's yours for the taking and you ought to take it and and enjoy the blessings of God. I think people ought to get happy once so I praise the Lord. I can remember my precious mother. Years ago, I seen a shout from one side of this building and the other. I saw a, a husband come down out of this choir and uh, praising God, waving his handkerchief, hollering hallelujah, and tears running down his face because he was happy in the Lord. Nothing wrong with that. We need more of that today. We need, oh, sister, well, out, oh, brother, amen, and uh, let him go into action once in a while. We need that today. And something else he did in verse 34, he set him on his own beast. That's just like Jesus. He said, now, are you riding my beast and I'll walk down the dusty road? That's what the good Samaritan did. He picked the man up, put him on his own beast, said, you ride, I'll walk. That's what Jesus did. He came down that we might go up. He walked up and down the shores of Galilee. We might walk down the Hallelujah Avenue, kick up gold dust, the glory of God in the future. Jesus came down that we might go up and suffer, that we might not suffer. He died that we might live. And remember, he said, now you ride my beast and I will walk. And that he did. Now notice in verse 34, he brought him to an inn. Now the inn in the Bible is somewhat a type of the church. And the innkeeper is a type of the Holy Spirit. Now the Bible doesn't give the name here of the innkeeper. You find several places in the Bible where a person that represents the Holy Spirit doesn't give his name. Abraham's a servant, when he went to get a bride for Isaac, didn't give his name. Joseph, when he had his servant to bring his brother in to sit down at the table, didn't give his name. And we find many places in the Bible where a person of the type of the Spirit doesn't give his name. You know why? The Holy Ghost doesn't brag on himself. He wants to brag on Jesus. He wants you to brag on Jesus. And he doesn't brag on himself. And you need to remember that. So he brought him to an inn and placed him in the inn. And he said to the innkeeper, which is the type of the Holy Spirit, I want you to take care of this man. I want you to protect him, watch over him, keep him in the inn, and see he's well taken care of. Now that's what God does with us when we get saved. The Holy Spirit takes over and teaches us, guides us, comforts us, leads us, strengthens us as we sojourn. God can take care of his children. In verse 39, 34 it said there, take care of him. Before God lets you start this, he put his angel on half rations and give you the other half. God wants you to be taken care of. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. He may not give you all your wants every time you want it, but he can take care of your need. He said, take care of him. David said in Psalms chapter 37 and verse 25, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. This is the grace of God. God can take care of his children. What are you worrying about? God knows how to do it and he can do it and he will do it. The Holy Spirit will take care of you in every need that you have, regardless of what it is. Now let's move on to another thought and that is in verse 35. We find the good Samaritan promise to return. He said, when I come again, when I come again, I'm glad that Jesus promised to return. Jesus said, I'm going away, but not to stay. I'm coming back again. He tells you that many times in the Bible. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'll come again, receive you unto myself. Jesus is coming. Whether you believe it or not, Jesus is coming, and it may come today. It may be tonight. It may be tomorrow. It may be next week. The Son of God is coming back again. Well, you believe it or not, he's coming. 
He is coming. Be looking for him. Keep your eyes looking up and uh, uh, for the Lord to come. I don't mean to start and stare toward the heavens, but be looking up in your mind and heart for the Lord to come at any time. He said, I'm coming again. And in verse 35, the man gave him two pence. The good Samaritan said, you take these two pence, and that's about equivalent to two pennies. We find in Matthew chapter 20, verse 2, and when he agreed with them for a penny a day, he put him in the vineyard and said, you go work for a penny a day. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. We find in Psalms chapter 9 and verse 4, For a thousand years in thy sight, all but is yesterday when it's past, and as a watch in the night. We find in Hosea chapter 6 verse 1 and 2, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn. He will heal us, he has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. In John chapter 4 and verse 40, So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tear with him, and he abode two days. And that's not without great significance. He gave him two pence, the two pennies representing two days and the Bible said a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years a day. Now why didn't he give him three? He knew he wouldn't be gone three thousand years or three days. Why did he just give him one? He knew he'd be gone more than a thousand years or one day. Why did he give him two? He knew he'd be gone approximately two thousand years. That's not without great significance. 2,000 years, a year with the Lord, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years a day, a penny a day. And the good Samaritan said, you take these two, representing these 2,000 years, I'll be gone, and I'll be back. And Jesus Christ is soon coming to 2,000 years, just about up. Oh, you say, preacher, you're trying to set a date? No, we don't know the 60-minute period of time, or the 24-hour the, uh, period of time, the day or the hour. Because if we say it be in 60 minutes, it might be 65 minutes. If we say it be in a day, it might be 20, uh, 13 hours or 25 hours. We, we can't say the day of the hour. The Bible did say, not forsake the sinners ourselves together and exhort one another that much the more as ye see that day approaching. If you know anything about current events, you know the Lord is coming. If you know anything about the Bible, you know the time is drawing nigh when our dear Lord will be coming back again. So he gave him enough to take care of about 2,000 years, and he said, I will be back. But he didn't, he didn't stop there. In verse 35, he said, now, if there's anything extra, charge that to me too. That shows that Jesus Christ, our advocate, is the right hand of the Father. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, if any man sin, we have an enemy with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, wherefore is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, see the ever living to make intercessions for them. Paul said in the little book of Philemon, if this slave owes you anything, charge that to me. Now what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying the good Samaritan is not the right hand of God the Father. And when the devil comes accusing the brothering, accusing us before God, what does Jesus do? He says, Father, charge that to me too. I paid the entire sin debt on Calvary. See, there's nothing going to be charged to God's children. All that's charged to Jesus. That's why you ought to love him. He said, if there's anything extra, I'll take care of that too. And when Jesus died on the cross, are you listening? Keep your feet on the floor and listen to the preacher. Are you listening? Look at the preacher. Jesus died on the cross. He paid all your past sins. He paid all your present sins. And he paid for all your future sins. That's why God will spank you, child train you. That's why God will chase you as a child of God if you don't walk straight. Because he's paid for all your sins. And God will take you to the barn, out behind the barn, and get the whip to you if you don't obey him. Sinners, no, they're going to hell. They're going to pay for their own sins in hell. But Jesus paid for all of yours on the cross when he died and paid that sin. That, that's why you ought to love him with all your heart. That's why you ought to be propped in serving God. It grieves my heart to see people come dragging into Sunday school late. Lord, have mercy. That grieves me. It grieves my heart when people come dragging in the church late. You know why? They're just too infernal lazy to get up and get ready. That's it. They don't go to the job late. Did they be fired before the week's out? They're just too lazy and don't love God enough to put forth that special effort to get up on in time and get ready and come to the house of God. That grieves me. That grieves me. It ought to grieve you, and it would if you love God. 
If you love God, that would grieve you. If you love God and you knew you'd come to the house of God late, that would grieve you until you ask God to forgive you. That's right. You may say, preacher, you, you got, you, you're going to make me mad. Well, you got forever to get glad. Yet I'm telling you the truth. This preacher is telling you the truth. You better listen to me. If you love God like you should, it would grieve your heart to come drag into the service late. Unless she's absolutely sick or providentially hindered or a tire blew out or somebody had a wreck knocked you out of the road or something happened. And if you were late, that would so grieve you, you'd ask God to forgive you. Because when you go on your job tomorrow, you go dragging in there about 30 minutes late, 15 minutes late. You do that two or three uh, mornings or days and uh, he'll say, I'd like to see you in the office. We don't have any need. If you don't preach your job anymore than to come dragging you late, we'll just get somebody else. And that's why you ought to love God and put God first. And if you're going to be late about anything, don't let it be late about God's work and God's business. Put God first in your life. You'd be glad you did. Since God saved me, I've always tried to be on time. If I wasn't on time, I'd get on my knees and ask God to forgive me for, for not being on time. It grieves my heart. And it ought to grieve your heart. If it don't, you better, you better kind of check up. There's something wrong somewhere. You better check it. This is God's business and the most important business in all the world. Oh, you say now, preacher, I'm going to get mad at you. If you get mad at me, you let me know that I go home and eat with you. I sure will. I eat anything that crawls. All you do is cut his head off, put some salt on it, and I'll help you eat it. I went down to Brother David Lewis's the other day, and the first thing he showed me, he had a bug down there that he had carved an insect and had it ready for me. He heard me make that statement. And so he didn't help me eat it, so I just left it there, went on in the house to eat what his good wife had. But this preacher, you know, you got no right to get mad at this preacher when he preaches you the word of God, and I'm not apologizing for anything. I'm telling you what you ought to do. And you go see a doctor, and the doctor tells you what you need to do to get well. Don't get mad at the doctor. He's trying to get you well. And by all means, don't get mad at God's man. If he tells you what you ought to do, he's trying to help you. And if you did get mad at him, there's something wrong with you. Amen? amen. Say amen, oh me one. You know I'm telling you the truth. All right, let's obey the Lord and serve God faithfully. And I hope God used the message today to stir your heart. Everybody stand to your feet for a moment of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, use the message today. Speak to hearts. Have you in this invitation? God, speak to the radio listen audience. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. David's going to play a couple of stanzas. That's why she plays. Listen to me now very, very carefully. If you're here today and you're not saved, or you're backslidden on God, or you're looking for a church home, and you'd like for Northside to be your church home, Come down this aisle for any other reason. I didn't mention you need to come forward. Will you come at this time? While we wait. If God is speaking to your heart, would you come? Come on, if God is speaking. All I can do is preach the word. I can't, I can't force you to come. I wouldn't do it. I'll preach to you the word. God's not going to force anybody to get saved. He'll save them if they want to be saved, but he's not going to force them to get saved against their will. Is God speaking today?